Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number 11, ready for teaching on June 10. The author is Pastor Mark Finlay and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled The Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast, Part 1. Sabbath afternoon, June 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, your word is so precious to us. And as we open it, and as we're looking at the last book of the Bible this quarter, Lord, we just thank you that not only does it tell stories, not only does it provide prophecies, but it points us to Jesus. And as we study your word this week, we pray that we may see Jesus, that we may put our trust, our confidence, and our salvation in his hands. We pray that each of us may have the faith that we need to accept him and to follow him. And today, Lord, I'd like to pray for those who are not well, who are listening, those who maybe can't read because of eye or other problems that make it difficult and that you will bless each one as we listen to your word this week. And I'd also like to pray for Geraldine at Woodford in Queensland, for Millicent Marston in Michigan, for Raymond Jr. Thorne in Panama, for Nevis Warren, for Frank Harris, for Earl Jules, and Earl comes from St. Lucia, and for for Maggie Walters from Kingston, and Charlotte Gordon and her husband who listen, Lord, and also for Andrew Green and Maisilyn Fuller. Lord, wherever we're listening, we pray that you will not only just bless us, but that we may follow you and do what you would require of us. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Let's read that again, Revelation 7, verses 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. As we study end-time events in regard to the mark of the beast, one crucial point that comes through is the difference between how God operates and how the enemy of souls does. As we've been studying, the central issues in the great controversy between Christ and Satan are loyalty, authority, and worship. The prophecies describing the beast power in Revelation 13, the little horn in Daniel 7, and the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2 all speak of a power that usurps God's authority, commands loyalty, and introduces a counterfeit system of worship. And it does so through the use of force, coercion, and at times bribes and rewards, all in order to compel worship. In contrast, love is the great motivating force of the kingdom of God. Rather than worshipping the beast, God's people find their greatest joy and highest delight in worshipping him. They are committed to him because they know how committed he is to them. There is only one thing that will keep any of us from receiving the mark of the beast in the end time, a love for Jesus so deep that nothing can break our hold upon him. In this lesson, we will explore these themes further. Sunday, June 4, Steadfast Endurance As we've seen in Revelation 14 verse 7, God calls all people to worship the Creator. 
This is the first angel's message. In Revelation 14.8, God warns people about Babylon, a false religious system with roots back in ancient Babylon. This is the second angel's message. In Revelation 14, 9 and 10, the third angel warns against worshipping the beast. The angel declares in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Read Revelation 14, verse 12. What two characteristics do we discover in this passage about God's last day people? Why are both important? Revelation 14.12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Greek word for patience is hupomene, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E, which is better translated steadfast endurance. Let me read the verse there with this. Here is the steadfast endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God will have an end-time people who are loyal to him in the face of opposition and fierce persecution. Through his grace, they stand with steadfast endurance, living God-centred, grace-filled, obedient lives. Worshipping the Creator, as we read in verse 7 of chapter 14, stands in direct opposition to worshipping the beast that we read in verse 9, and finds its expression in a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus in verse 12. Let's read those verses. Verse 7 of chapter 14 in Revelation, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, and then that verse in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This final conflict over allegiance to Christ or allegiance to the beast power revolves around worship. And at the heart of this great controversy between good and evil is going to be the Sabbath. Read Romans chapter 8 verses 1 to 4, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 and Colossians 1, 29. What do these passages teach us about the result of living by faith? Romans 8, beginning at verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And Colossians 1.29, To this end I also labour, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Living by faith, we receive his grace, and our lives are changed. The committed followers of the Saviour not only will have faith in Jesus, but also will have the faith of Jesus. Jesus' quality of end-time faith will be theirs, and they will remain faithful even unto death, as Jesus did. And so to finish today, how faithful are you in the little things? What might that tell you about how you will be when the real trial comes? 
And we finish with Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. And that reads, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Monday, June 5, The Cosmic Struggle Read Matthew twenty seven forty five to 50 What does this teach us about what Christ experienced on the cross? What did Jesus mean by asking God why he had forsaken him? And how does this scene help us understand what it means to have the faith of Jesus? Let's begin in Matthew 27 and verse 45. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Hanging on the cross, enshrouded in darkness, bearing the guilt, shame and condemnation of the sins of the world, and shut off from the sense of his Father's love, Jesus depended on the relationship that he had with the Father throughout his life. That is, through a life of complete dependence upon the Father, even in good times, Jesus had been prepared for the worst times, even the cross. The Saviour trusted, even when all around him the circumstances cried out for him to doubt. Even when it seemed that God had forsaken him, Jesus didn't give up. Ellen White writes in Christ Triumphant, page 277, Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. By faith, Christ was the victor. End of quote. The faith of Jesus is a faith so deep, so trusting, so committed, that all the demons in the cosmos and all the trials on earth cannot shake it. It is a faith that trusts when it cannot see, believes when it cannot understand, hangs on when there is little to hang on to. This faith of Jesus is itself a gift we receive by faith, and it will carry us through the crisis ahead. It is the faith of Jesus dwelling in our hearts that enables us to worship Christ as supreme and steadfastly endure when Revelation's mark of the beast is enforced. And yet, it is not something that out of nowhere suddenly appears. God's people have been learning to live by faith, day by day, now. In good times, in bad times when God feels close, when God seems far away. It doesn't matter. The just shall live by faith, we read in Galatians 3.11. And we'll also look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. But first of all, Galatians 3, verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The time for preparation is now. Every trial now, if endured in faith, can bear precious fruit in our lives. And so to finish today, think about a time when life seemed to crumble around you and all that you had was your faith. How did you get by? What lessons did you learn? What did you experience that could help others who might be going through something similar? (music) 
Tuesday, June 6, The Ungodly Chain The prophecy regarding the mark of the beast is about religious intolerance, an economic boycott, persecution, and eventually a death decree. Surprisingly, it is also a message of encouragement. Even in the worst of times, God will sustain his people who, as it says in Revelation 14.12, keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And among those commandments, of course, is the fourth, the seventh day Sabbath. The Mark of the Beast prophecy in Revelation 13 tells us about the worst and absolute fever pitch of Satan's war against God. His first strategy in this campaign is deception. Revelation 13 tells us about a time in the future when the devil will work through an earthly religio-political power called the beast and resort to force. Religious persecution, of course, is not new. It has been around ever since Cain killed Abel for worshipping the way God instructed them to worship. And let's read about that in Genesis 4. Verses 1 to 8. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Jesus said persecution would happen even to believers in the first century and down through the ages. The time is coming, he warned in John 16 too, that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And we'll also look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved and first peter chapter 4 verse 12 beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you the mark of the beast prophecy is about the final link in this ungodly chain like the persecutions in the past it is designed to force everyone to conform to a certain set of beliefs and an approved system of worship Read Revelation 13, verses 15 to 17. What will God's end-time people face in the final crisis? So we read from Revelation 13, beginning at verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The prophecy says the persecution will start with economic sanctions. No one can buy or sell unless they have the mark. When this happens, the immense majority will capitulate. Anyone who refuses will eventually be placed under a death decree. The devil is preparing professed Christians by compromises in their lives to receive the mark of the beast when the final test comes upon us in the future. God's love for each one of us will strengthen us and preserve us during the troublous times ahead. 
And so to finish the day, read Galatians 6, verses 7 to 9. Though this is not written in the context of last day events, why is the principle here so relevant to issues over the mark of the beast and how we can stand faithful? And Galatians 6, beginning at verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Wednesday, June 7. Those who follow the Lamb. Read Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. Where does the beast come from, and who gives the beast his authority? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The first beast power of Revelation 13 receives his power, seat, and great authority from the dragon. Revelation 12.9 and Revelation 20 verse 2 identified the dragon as Satan. Let's just check that. Revelation 12 verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. And Revelation 20 verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Satan is a cunning foe and works through earthly powers. Revelation 12, 3-5 says this dragon, the devil, attempted to destroy the male child as soon as he was born. Let's read that. Revelation 12, beginning at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. This male child was later caught up to God and his throne. This, of course, refers to Christ. Desiring to destroy the Christ child, Satan worked through Herod and Imperial Rome. At the end of Jesus' life, a Roman governor, Pilate condemned Christ to die, a Roman executioner nailed him to the cruel cross, a Roman soldier pierced him with a spear, and Roman soldiers guarded his tomb. According to Revelation 13.2, the dragon, Satan, working through pagan Rome, would give the seat of its government to this emerging beast power. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 817, has this quote. Though primarily representing Satan, the dragon, in a secondary sense, represents the Roman Empire. The power succeeding the Roman Empire, which received from the dragon his power and his seat and great authority, is clearly Papal Rome. And then from the Seventh Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 817 again, uh, we have from the rise of the medieval church by historian A.C. Flick. He explains that out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman church. End of quote. Read Revelation 13 verse 3 and Revelation 14 verse 4. 
What contrast do you see in these verses? Revelation 13, verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marvelled and followed the beast. And then Revelation 14, verse 4, These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. In contrast to all the world who follows the beast, God will have a people who will follow the Lamb instead. As always, it will be one side or the other, for Jesus or against Jesus. There will be then, as now, no middle ground, no neutral position. To not firmly commit to Jesus is, consciously or not, to commit to the other side. And so to finish today, Matthew 10.22 says, And you will be hated for all my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. How ready are you to endure to the end? Thursday, June 8. Jesus, our only mediator. Read Revelation chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. What identifying marks of the beast power do we discover in these verses? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 4. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. The beast of Revelation is an apostate religious power that rises out of pagan Rome and grows to become a worldwide system of worship. According to Revelation 13.5, it is a blasphemous power. In the New Testament, blasphemy is equated with assuming the privileges and prerogatives of God as an equal. Read Luke 5, 18-26 and John 10.33. What two aspects of blasphemy do these verses identify? First of all, Luke 5, beginning at verse 18. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralysed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the house top and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easy to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralysed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And John 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus was accused of blasphemy by the leaders. In Jesus' case, the accusations were unjust because he has all the powers and prerogatives of God, including the right to forgive our sins. And that is because Jesus is God. Or as he so powerfully expressed it in John 14, 9, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Meanwhile, 1 Timothy 2.5 teaches that there is one mediator between God and man, 
the man Christ Jesus. Let's read that. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. In contrast, the Roman Church teaches that the priest is the mediator between God and sinful humanity. But, because the priest himself is a sinful human being, he cannot be our mediator because he also needs a mediator. Blasphemy also is defined as the claim of any human to be God or to stand in the place of God. Here are just two statements from the Roman Church's authoritative sources. From Prompta Bibliotheca, published in 1763, volume 6, pages 25 to 29, Lucas Ferraris, Papa or Pope, article 2, writes, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man. He is, as it were, God on earth. And from Pope Leo the Thirteenth, he boasted in the great encyclical letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, published in 1903, page 193, we, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. These claims become even more relevant when we understand that the prefix anti, as in antichrist, doesn't always mean against, but also can mean in the place of. Hence, antichrist also means in place of Christ. Talk about blasphemy. Friday, June 9. From The Great Controversy, page 582, we read, From the very beginning of the Great Controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. To deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts, the results will be ultimately the same. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrines of the Bible, and errors have thus become incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the Scriptures. The last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. End of quote. Throughout Revelation, worship and creation are indissolubly linked. The essence of the controversy between good and evil and the issues surrounding the mark of the beast revolve around whether God is worthy to be worshipped. As we have seen, the concept of Christ as Creator is at the very heart of Sabbath worship. Jesus consistently underlines the significance of the day of which he calls himself the Lord in Matthew 12.8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath in Mark 2. 28, therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath, and in Luke 6 and verse 5, and he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an eternal reminder of our identity. It reminds us of who we are as human beings. It places worth on every human being. It constantly reinforces the idea that we are created beings and that our Creator is worthy of our allegiance and worship. This is the reason why the devil hates the Sabbath so much. It is the golden link that unites us with our Creator. And this is why it will play such a crucial role in the final crisis at the end. And that brings us to our final two questions, our two discussion questions. Number one, what are the basic principles behind the sea beast claim to authority? In what ways can those same attitudes be lodged in our hearts without our knowledge? And two, 
How do you respond to those who argue that the idea of a literal Satan is a primitive superstition, that educated or at least intelligent people can't take seriously? What arguments could you use in response? And now for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. I Can't Do This by Andrew McChesney The party sounded perfect. A table was booked at a club in Harare, Zimbabwe. Alcohol was purchased and people were invited. But Elder didn't come. What happened? Hubert asked when he later saw his friend. I can't do this, Elder replied. I am an elder. Hubert had heard the explanation before. He and Elder had become friends while teaching at a high school in Harare. 19-year-old Hubert was taking off a year to teach before entering the university. Elder was 25 and an elder at the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hubert partied, but Elder would not participate. He always explained, I can't do this, I'm an elder. Hubert had never met an Adventist before and he thought, this guy is true to his church, but he declined Elder's invitations to go to church. The next year, Hubert enrolled at Midlands State University in Guru. He kept remembering Elder and he visited an Adventist church for the first time. The people were warm and friendly and the sermon touched his heart. During the semester break, he went to another Adventist church while visiting an aunt. It got to the point that every time he saw a church, he wanted to go inside. He felt like something was missing from his spiritual life. For his second year of studies, Hubert received a scholarship to study in Russia. He wondered whether he would find an Adventist church there. One day, he was drunk when Mildred arrived at the birthday party of a mutual friend at 8pm in Moscow. Why did you come so late? he asked. I was at church, Mildred said. But it's Saturday, Hubert said. Church is on Sunday. Well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, she said. Hubert couldn't believe his ears. Mildred saw his interest and invited him to go to church the next Sabbath. She even waited for him in the metro station on Sabbath morning. But Hubert was embarrassed that she had seen him drunk and did not show up. When she called to see where he was, he found himself saying, I'm sorry, I'll come next Sabbath. Mildred called him throughout the week to remind him of his promise. He accompanied her to the Moscow International Seventh-day Adventist Church on Sabbath. A year later, Hubert gave his heart to Jesus in baptism. He contacted Elder and thanked him for being faithful. Elder was overjoyed. Today, Hubert Nobadza is an active church member. I am thankful to God that he led me to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he said. This story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. For more information, visit IWillGo2020.org. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in a YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. 
That is the one with the blue rectangular icon with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.